Greetings and welcome back participants to our first session of the Africa Calls Cytopathology Lecture Series for 2023-2024. I'm Dr. Leslie Lomo, surgical pathologist and cytopathologist at the University of Utah here in Salt Lake City and faculty co-coordinator of this series here to moderate today's session. I am so very pleased to welcome back Dr. Paul Vanderland as our guest speaker today. Dr. Vanderland obtained his PhD and MD degrees from the University of Chicago and Pritzker School of Medicine in Chicago, Illinois. He completed his anatomic pathology residency, cytopathology, and cardiothoracic pathology fellowship training at the Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston, Massachusetts. He was then recruited to the Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, where he is now the Director of Surgical Pathology, as well as Director of Cytopathology and Thoracic Pathology, and an Associate Professor of Pathology at Harvard Medical School. He has published extensively in his areas of clinical interest and expertise, which center on the practice of cytopathology and pulmonary pathology, both neoplastic and non-neoplastic disease. He has numerous accomplishments and accolades, and for brevity, I'll highlight just a couple, uh, that he is an expert editorial board member of the IARC and IAC working on the WHO, IARC, and IAC, International System for Reporting Lung Cytopathology. And he is now the co-editor of the Bethesda System for Reporting Thyroid Cytopathology. And so we are very fortunate that he is kicking off our series uh, for this year, that he will provide an overview of the latest third edition, so extremely timely. So just a quick reminder, please, if you would like to submit a, a question for our speaker, please use the Q&A function and we'll address questions at the end of Dr. Vanderland's presentation. And so with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Vanderland. Wonderful, Leslie. Uh, thank you so very much for that introduction. Uh, and thank you to the ASCP and the ASC for inviting me back uh, to talk about my other passion. Uh, previously, I talked about pulmonary cytopathology and pulmonary pathology. Today, I'll be talking about thyroid cytopathology and um, uh, going over uh, basically the new third edition of the Bethesda system for reporting thyroid cytopathology. Um, so uh, there's my, my info, uh, contact info, please feel free to uh, email me if you have any questions. And then also uh, my disclosures, um, these are my uh, uh, conflicts of interest, but uh, should be unrelated to the content of this presentation. So what we hope to accomplish over the next uh, uh, 45 minutes, hour or so, uh, is to first recognize the relevant terminology changes introduced in this new third edition of the Bethesda System for Reporting Thyroid Cytopathology. Um, we'll discuss a little bit how the, the, the diagnostic criteria have been refined and, and slightly modified for certain categories, including benign, AUS, and follicular neoplasm. Uh, and then finally, uh, touch a little bit on the role that radiologic imaging and molecular testing plays in thyroid uh, nodule management. Uh, and so with that, uh, we'll start with a little bit of epidemiologic data. If we look at the most recent uh, data in the United States provided by this, the NIH, uh, we see that thyroid cancer uh, is the 12th most common uh, cancer with back to incidents, uh, accounting for about two, a little over 2% of all uh, new cancers uh, diagnosed in the United States. But the, the, the mortality and the death rate is very low, you know, only uh, accounting for 0.3% of all cancer deaths in 2023. Um, we've seen uh, over the last number of decades, a, a almost meteoric rise in the incidence of thyroid cancer. Um, likely due to uh, increased imaging modalities, uh, neck and thyroid ultrasound, um, discovering many more nodules uh, uh, that are clinically silent or that would not be appreciated by palpation alone. Of note though, starting in about 2014, given this recognition of uh, increased detection of indolent thyroid nodules, uh, we've seen about a 2% annual decrease in the incidence of, um, of thyroid cancers, uh, but still um, is, is much higher than it was uh, many decades ago. Now, in preparation for this talk, I did a little um, investigation into the uh, global uh, incidence of, the, uh, of thyroid cancers and mortality rates. And it's very interesting to look um, worldwide. Uh, we see a number of patterns emerge. Uh, number one, uh, as, as in most practices, we are very familiar with uh, almost a three to one um, 
uh, ratio of uh, thyroid cancer in females as compared to males. So it's a much more common uh, uh, cancer in females as compared to males. And if you look at the, again, the incidence rates worldwide, uh, the highest incidence rates are in uh, North America, Brazil, and a number of European countries, as well as Australia um, and, and China. So in, in general, uh, very much a higher incidence rate, both for males and females um, in, in the, the high income uh, nations. However, if you look at, at Africa, uh, it, overall, um, the, the incidence rates are much, much lower throughout m most of the African continent. Now, if we look at the, uh, the relationship between the incidence and mortality rates of thyroid cancer, again, based on the most recent Global Can uh, 2020 uh, data, we can see that in Africa, um, thyroid cancer only accounts for 3.1% of the worldwide uh, incidence of thyroid cancer. However, the mortality rate uh, is, is uh, unproportionately higher uh, at, at about 10% of all global mortality uh, from thyroid cancer. Um, compared to other other continents. Uh, if we were to look at this pictorially, so this is almost the mirror image of the incidence rates. If you look at the, the mortality rates, and what I'm showing here are the mortality rates for women, uh, the mortality uh, for thyroid cancer is much higher in most African uh, countries as compared to uh, those countries with very high thyroid cancer incidence, so North America and Europe and Australia. And so I think that this, um, this highlights a few things. Number one, uh, likely the overdiagnosis um, that we've seen in, in recent decades um, of very indolent cancers, uh, especially in high income countries. Um, uh, but on the flip side, uh, certainly there is a, uh, a, a need for uh, increased recognition and detection of thyroid cancers um, in, in lower income settings as well, and, and a need to uh, address them at earlier stages when they are potentially curable. Coming back to the United States and the most recent SEER data, we can see that uh, the vast majority of thyroid cancers are um, uh, identified uh, either at the localized, confined to the thyroid, or with only regional spread to regional lymph nodes. Um, a very small minority um, has distant metastases. And that uh, early stage disease is one of the reasons why there's a really an amazing uh, uh, survival rate. So the five-year relative survival rate for localized or even uh, local regional uh, spread uh, is well over 95%. And the 25-year survival uh, mirrors that uh, as well. So this is a very survivable disease. Um, again, especially if it's a, a lower-grade cancer that's caught earlier. Now, if we look historically at, uh, at the uh, uh, incidence of thyroid nodules and, and cancer, um, thyroid nodules are very common in the population. Um, and before thyroid fine needle aspiration was uh, used regularly to help triage those nodules for surgery or surveillance, um, if we look at some old historical um, data from the Mayo Clinic, we, we see that uh, in the pre-FNA era, about 14% of resected thyroid nodules turned out to be malignant. So the vast majority of resected thyroid nodules uh, were, were actually benign. If we look uh, at a more recent cohort, uh, namely this really nice uh, meta-analysis that was published in Cancer Cytopathology a few years ago, looking at about 38 um, different studies um, spanning both, uh, both Western uh, populations as well as Asian uh, populations uh, that looked at uh, almost 150,000 thyroid FNAs. Uh, they, they found that really in the modern FNA era, uh, this, the percentage of nodules that are actually cancer is much higher, about 34% um, uh, according to this meta-analysis. So clearly thyroid FNA has done its job in helping to enrich those nodules going to surgery that are malignant uh, where surgery really is needed. Um, so if we were to again to rewind before the Bethesda era, the, the topic of this talk, um, this is uh, in looking at the, the landscape of thyroid fine needle aspiration and thyroid reporting, um, in, the, in the decades that led up to the uh, NCI 2007 State of the Science Conference and the first edition of the Bethesda System for Reporting Thyroid Cytopathology, 
um, we can see that the landscape was quite varied. This is a very uh, nice uh, review article uh, put together by uh, Helen Wang, who is uh, here at the Beth Israel Deaconess, uh, my predecessor and the former uh, uh, director of cytopathology here at BIDMC. And she did this deep dive into the literature, looking at all those publications from 1966 to 2003, accounted for 87 different publications on thyroid fine needle aspiration. And she really uh, showed that there was a very heterogeneous practice um, uh, at that time uh, with different reporting schemes, uh, varying from a two-tier reporting scheme all the way up to a six or more tiered reporting scheme. And each one of those reporting schemes had a, had a quite disparate sensitivity and specificity, positive and negative predictive value uh, for uh, detecting uh, malignancy. And so clearly there was a need for a standardization and, and for a, a common language in, in thyroid fine needle aspiration. And really, if we think about one of the major trends over the last few decades in cytopathology, it really is the emergence of uh, cytology reporting systems. And of course, this started out really with the Bethesda system as the model, the Bethesda system for cervical cytology um, that uh, really standardized the way that we approach pap smears and pap smear reporting. That is, of course, now in its third, uh, in its third edition. Uh, that was followed uh, next by the Bethesda system for reporting thyroid cytopathology, which we'll be talking about for the remainder of this talk, again, now in its third edition. But of course, we have also uh, seen uh, reporting systems in other organ systems as well, including the Paris system for reporting urinary cytology, now in its second edition. The Milan system for reporting salivary gland cytopathology, uh, with the second edition uh, just, uh, just recently being published as well. Uh, and then other organ systems, including uh, serous fluids, the, uh, the international system for reporting serous fluid cytology, the international system for uh, breast FNAs, the uh, pancreatic biliary and the respiratory systems, uh, all, all of these helping standardizing reporting for all of these different uh, organ systems. And of course, the, the most recent uh, iteration is the WHO finally um, taking that model of the surgical pathology blue books and applying them to cytopathology as well. And so as of uh, right now in the summer of 2023, the lung cytopathology and the pancreatic biliary cytopathology books um, have been published um, with additional WHO books in the works, including lymph nodes, soft tissue, liver, breast, uh, and kidney and adrenal. Uh, and so really, this has been a, a, a unifying uh, a way to, uh, across the world, approach different uh, specimen types uh, and have a unified language for reporting these. And for thyroid FNA reporting, as in all of these reporting systems, the goal is to create a system that is succinct, unambiguous, and clinically helpful. And really, the, in doing so, you can help facilitate clarity of communication you know, facilitating clear and effective communication, not only within the pathology and the cytopathology community, but also between the cytopathologists and our clinicians, the endocrinologists, surgeons, and radiologists, and other healthcare providers. So we are providing a very clear diagnosis uh, for each specimen. And that diagnosis should basically be linked to clinically relevant information having well-defined risk of malignancies for each diagnostic category, and ideally linking each category to a recommended specific management recommendation. Uh, and then lastly, again, having this universal language is so important because it allows for effective and reliable sharing of data, not only between laboratories, uh, but also in, in the literature and uh, being able to publish uh, results and have those results translatable to other practice settings. And so really these are the goals of these reporting systems. And the Bethesda system for reporting thyroid cytopathology is, is, uh, is, is no exception. So if we look at, at the, the, the brief history of the, the, uh, th the Bethesda system for reporting thyroid cytopathology, the first edition came out in 2010. And of course, this followed the 2007 National Cancer Institute Thyroid State of the Science session, uh, where a, a gathering of cytopathologists, endocrinologists, clinicians, surgeons came together to really help um, formulate the roots and the, the foundation for the Bethesda system uh, and how we report thyroid FNAs. 
This was met with great success. And um, uh, in 2018, the second edition uh, of the, the Bethesda System Atlas was published. And basically that uh, had incorporated uh, over the, those seven or eight years um, new advancements in the field, including the 2015 updated American Thyroid Association guidelines, um, a recognition of the increasing uh, use and utility of molecular testing in thyroid fine needle aspirations, and also accounting for this new entity, the NIFT-P, the, uh, the uh, non-infiltrative follicular uh, lesion with uh, uh, papillary-like nuclear features that was introduced in 2016 that, that is very difficult to prospectively identify on FNA, but has implications for uh, surgery and surgical management going forward. Uh, and so finally, in, in 2023, uh, happy to uh, to uh, share uh, what's new in this new third edition of the Bethesda system uh, for reporting thyroid cytopathology. Um, so, uh, so what is new? Uh, so uh, first off, uh, the book is in print uh, and is available uh, both as an e-document uh, e as well as a physical in-print book. Um, uh, important to note, and this is to remind me that um, all of the book royalties, as with previous editions, um, uh, do not go to any of the authors or editors. Um, all of those book royalties go to the American Society of Cytopathology. And so um, any proceeds from the book um, go to help further the mission of the American Society of Cytopathology. Um, in addition to the book, uh, in the last month, uh, two uh, brief overviews of the system have been, re have been published um, in the journal Thyroid and in the journal the American Society of Cytopathology. So I direct you to those uh, two brief uh, overview articles if you're looking for a succinct uh, summary uh, of, of what's new in this uh, third edition of the Bethesda system. Now, what hasn't changed is at its core, the Bethesda system for reporting thyroid cytopathology is based on cytomorphology. What do the thyroid FNA aspirates look like under the microscope? And based on the cellular components and the, uh, the uh, background components as well, we are able to very accurately uh, uh, categorize these aspirates with defined risks of malignancy that range from the benign aspirate where you have uh, flat sheets, macrofollicular fragments of very benign appearing, uh, evenly spaced uh, thyroid follicular cells in a background of colloid uh, on the one end of the spectrum to the clearly malignant uh, uh, papillary thyroid carcinoma uh, changes that we see on the other end of the spectrum where you see uh, those characteristic um, nuclear enlargement, nuclear pallor, grooves, pseudo-inclusions, crowding. And then uh, accounting for all of the spectrum of changes that we see in between uh, to categorize them into the appropriate category. So once again, at its heart, the Bethesda system is a cytomorphology-based um, classification system for thyroid FNAs. So in this third edition, um, at the helm, uh, we once again have the, the, the steady leadership of Syed Ali uh, as, as one of the editors uh, who was there from the, uh, the get-go and one of the co-editors for the first and second editions. And then I have the really uh, you know, distinct honor and pleasure of, of joining uh, Syed as co-editor of this third edition. It's been uh, a wonderful experience and, and it's been uh, just great to uh, work closely with Syed over these last few years uh, to bring this third edition to fruition. And of course, there would be no third edition uh, without uh, the contributions of Ed Sebus. So uh, really uh, a big thank you to my mentor uh, and friend Ed Sebus for everything he has done, not only for the Bethesda system for reporting thyroid cytopathology, the first two editions, but really thyroid cytology and cytopathology uh, community as a whole. And so here are just a few shots from uh, last year's IAC ASC meeting um, uh, in Baltimore, where uh, we, we thanked uh, thanked Ed for all of his contributions, and uh, so I had presented him with a plaque from the American Society of Cytopathology for all of his work um, uh, on the previous two editions of the Bethesda system. So, in in addition to uh, to uh, change on the editor uh, level. 
For the first time, we also brought in uh, the expertise of, of world-renowned experts in thyroid cytopathology as associate editors on this third edition. And so uh, names very, very familiar to all of us in the cytopathology world, uh, Zubair Baloche uh, from UPenn, uh, Beatrix cotran uh from France, Fernando Schmidt uh, from Portugal, and Philippe Ville um, uh, from France. Again, um, you know, titans in the world of cytopathology and thyroid cytopathology, again, bringing in their expertise uh, to help uh, ensure that this third edition is as strong and, and focused as possible. And another change and something that I'd like to highlight is that um, this really does represent on many levels an international effort, reflecting the very widespread adoption of the Bethesda system for reporting thyroid cytopathology um, in, in many countries across the world. And so in contrast to the second edition, where there was a total of 44 authors, in this new third edition, uh, we increased the number of authors to 67. And this included authors from 55 different institutions, 18 countries, four continents, and also included more clinicians and radiologists. Again, to get as, as uh, global a perspective as possible on thyroid FNA reporting. Um, uh, unfortunately, uh, you know, I'm sad to see that we were not able to uh, bring in any uh, cytopathologists uh, from the continent of Africa uh, or Australia, but um, hopefully um, through additional uh, you know, contributions and, and perhaps when the fourth edition rolls around, we can remedy that and, and bring in more expertise um, uh, from the continent of Africa as well. So in, uh, in uh, looking at some of the major changes in this third edition, what if the most uh, 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 changes on the four that really um, uh, is noticeable is that for the first time we've decided on having a single name for each diagnostic category. Now in the past many categories had alternative names uh, that could be used uh, again to help facilitate the adoption of the system as well as to have some flexibility of, of transitioning from whatever local styles were used to the Bethesda system. But now that the Bethesda system has been around uh, for a long time now, it's a mature reporting system, uh, the benefits of having a single unified name for each category really outweigh um, any potential drawbacks. And you know, this includes not only a simplification of uh, the terminology, it also helps facilitate, again, one of our main goals, the absolute clarity of communication, uh, avoiding, commu uh, avoiding confusion between categories. In the past, there had been some uh, uh, some confusion, more on the clinical side of the difference between suspicious for a follicular neoplasm versus suspicious for malignancy. You know, two, two uh, different categories that have very different risks of malignancy, but both had suspicious in, um, uh, in, the, in the name. Um, and so also, if you look at other reporting systems used around the globe, um, each each category has a single name, and so uh, so the time uh, had really come for there to to be settled on a single name, the dominant name used in the literature and adopted uh, in most practices, and so that's uh, one of the most um, uh, noticeable changes in this third edition. Um, uh, in addition, a lot of work went into looking at all of the pro all of the studies published since the uh, second edition came out in two thousand seventeen two thousand eighteen. Um, and in doing so, we, we, a lot of work was done to refine and update the implied risks of malignancy for each diagnostic category. And uh, as you can see here, the, the, the risks of malignancy didn't change that much, but at least that this now represents uh, not only an expected range, but the mean, uh, the mean percentage risk of malignancy uh, for each diagnostic category. And this is based on, again, contemporary data. So this is really what, uh, what, what should be expected uh, today in 2023 and uh, going forward. Now, one of the caveats and one of the, the pitfalls when trying to establish a risk of malignancy um, is that uh, the risk of malignancy calculations are based on surgically resected data. So uh, what is seen on the thyroid FNA, um, does it correlate with what is seen at the time of surgical resection? A uh, classic variant, uh, a classic subtype of papillary thyroid carcinoma in this uh, example. 
Now, of course, I think all of us are very well familiar with the issues that come to the fore when dealing with surgical endpoints. Uh, and the first and most important of that is that, unfortunately, not all nodules are resected, especially for nodules of non-diagnostic benign or the AUS category. Uh, again, coming back to this really nice uh, large meta-analysis of studies, we can see that um, in both Western series and Asian series, uh, the resection rate varies from about 10% to maybe 30 or 40% for the non-diagnostic benign and AUS categories. So there certainly is a verification bias in the risk of malignancy on those uh, nodules that did go to surgery. Now, in addition, um, those lower risk nodules, the benign, the AUS nodules that are resected likely have other worries and features, um, radiographic features, ra rapid growth, uh, et cetera. Um, and so there's likely an inflated risk of malignancy, again, for those surgically resected nodules in that category. We do know that there is an additional layer of diagnostic subjectivity seen on the behalf of the surgical pathologist. Um, so there is uh, some uh, gray areas of uh, between NIFT-P and actual uh, uh, infiltrative or encapsulated infiltrative uh, variant of, of uh, PTC. Th so there can be some subjectivity on the back end. And lastly, just from a data gathering standpoint, there certainly can be a long lag or a temporal gap between the FNA and the resection. And this is this lagging outcome indicator can really pose a problem when, when trying to develop robust data sets of uh, surgically resected thyroid nodules and correlating them to the pre-surgical FNA result. Um, so as, as, as most of us are well aware, the vast majority of thyroid cancers are seen in adults, uh, in those uh, 20 years and older. But um, if you again look at the most recent 2023 SEER data, um, there is a small proportion of pediatric patients that do develop thyroid cancer. And looking at these, the studies that have come out in the peer-reviewed literature over the past 10 years or so, we've seen that the Bethesda system for reporting thyroid cytopathology has um, effectively been applied to uh, thyroid uh, FNAs in the pediatric population. And so as such, in, the, in this new third edition uh, of the Bethesda uh, System for Reporting Thyroid Cytopathology, for the first time, uh, we have incorporated and included uh, expected mean and ranges of risk of malignancy for each diagnostic category in the pediatric population. And uh, if, if I uh, go on to the next slide, that is, is a nice way of, of kind of comparing visually the adult uh, Bethesda risk of malignancies mean and ranges to the pediatric population, two things kind of come to the fore. Number one, in the pediatric population, we can see that overall the risk of malignancy for each diagnostic category is higher than that seen in the adult population. And that manifests itself in slightly more aggressive surgical management uh, guidelines and, and surgical management recommendations in the pediatric population compared to uh, the adult population. And secondly, um, since the absolute numbers of pediatric uh, thyroid FNAs is much lower than the adult population, you can see that the expected ranges uh, for each diagnostic category is much, much larger. And so hopefully over time, as we have more publications and more studies looking at the true risk of malignancy when applying the Bethesda system uh, to pediatric thyroid FNAs, hopefully those uh, expected uh, ROMs should come down and become a little tighter uh, as we have with the adult population. Now, finally, uh, when talking about the risk of malignancy, uh, once again, we ha now have another five, six years experience with NIFT-P and how to deal with NIFT-P. Uh, and so uh, the publications that have come out since the second edition are now incorporated into uh, refining the risk of malignancy when accounting for NIFT-P on the back end surgical pathology side of things. And here we uh, again show the expected uh, range and the percentage decrease for each diagnostic category um, uh, if you exclude NIFT-P from the risk of malignancy calculations. Uh, we again provide a mean percentage um, and then also do the math for you. And so if you're looking for a final single number for each diagnostic category, 
explaining what is the expected risk of malignancy if you're not in, in, including NIFT-P. Um, this is the, the best estimate uh, that, that we have at this point in time. So what other changes uh, are there in the new uh, third edition? Uh, well, we made a very concerted effort to harmonize and uh, align the terminology used in the third edition of the Bethesda system with the latest fifth edition or the, that came out in 2022 of the WHO classification of thyroid neoplasms. Uh, and some of the, 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 the salient changes include um, the, the concept of follicular nodular disease that we'll talk about when we get to the benign chapter. Um, uh, the discouragement, we're now discouraged uh, broadly in medicine from using eponyms uh, for medical uh, diseases or for cells of interest. And so uh, we're no longer supposed to use the, the term herthal cell, but rather um, oncocyte. And so uh, the former entity known as uh, follicular neoplasm herthal cell type now is termed oncocytic follicular neoplasm. In the uh, WHO classification of thyroid neoplasms, uh, there was an introduction of this category of high-grade follicular-derived thyroid carcinomas. And this includes the poorly differentiated thyroid carcinoma that we're very familiar with based on the Turin criteria of um, uh, solid trabecular insular growth with increased mitotic activity, uh, necrosis, and uh, 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 irregular crenated nuclei that do not have the nuclear uh, features of papillary thyroid carcinoma. But in addition, it's now introduced the differentiated high-grade thyroid carcinomas, recognizing that even in follicular carcinomas or traditional papillary thyroid carcinomas, if we see increased mitotic activity, numbering more than five, greater than or equal to five mitoses per two uh, millimeter squared, or the presence of tumor necrosis, that really does portend a, a more aggressive disease. And so those have been uh, lumped together and discussed together under the chapter 10 high-grade follicular derived thyroid carcinomas. And lastly, in the uh, malignant chapter, chapter eight, where papillary thyroid carcinoma is discussed, we still in included um, tumor entities known as the cribriform morular uh, thyroid carcinoma, NIFT-Ps, um, and hyalinizing trabecular tumor because their cytomorphology really does overlap with papillary thyroid carcinoma. Even though in the new edition of the WHO classification, these have been classified as malignant tumors of uncertain histogenesis or as low-risk follicular-derived neoplasms. So very briefly, let's touch on a couple of the diagnostic categories. First, the benign uh, category. And uh, as in most studies, the benign thyroid aspirate uh, accounts for the vast majority of the thyroid aspirates we see. Again, uh, a very good way to exclude uh, nodules from needing to go to surgery um, that can be watched uh, and monitored from a clinical standpoint. Now, by and large, the diagnostic criteria for a benign thyroid FNA uh, remains the same as it was in previous, uh, previous editions. But one of the, the, the nomenclature changes, again, is this, this idea of follicular nodular disease, benign follicular nodular disease. Um, as recommended in the 2022 uh, WHO classification in thyroid neoplasms, it really is an umbrella term that's used to, to uh, describe the spectrum of changes that have previously been called different names, benign colloid nodule, hyperplastic nodule, adenomatous or adenomatoid nodule, benign follicular nodule. And it's, it's a little difficult because the lines from a molecular standpoint are blurred because we've noticed that um, although morphologically there can be very much similar appearances to these different nodules, they may or may not represent clonal neoplasms. Um, and so the, the differentiation between hyperplastic nodules and adenomas or neoplastic lesions uh, really has blurred. All, all that being said, they're all benign uh, entities. And so by utilizing the term benign follicular nodular disease, uh, we, can, we don't have to uh, spin our wheels or worry about designating them as truly hyperplastic or neoplastic in nature but we can ensure the clinician that it is a benign nodule. The other uh, change uh, and, and kind of the, the new recognition from a cytomorphology standpoint is the concept of the thyroid spherule. Um, and this was introduced in, in a paper that came out of uh, Brigham and Women's Hospital, uh, senior authored by Ed Sebus, where 
identifying that not all very small follicles are micro follicles. And as a corollary to that, they, they don't all behave clinically the same way. And so the, the, they put forth this concept of the thyroid spherule, which is a small thyroid uh, follicle formation that is not a micro follicle. And they're not micro follicles because, as you can see in some of these examples, um, the, there is a ma ma maintaining of the polarity of the uh, follicular cells. They are very evenly spaced without nuclear overlapping or crowding around this three-dimensional uh, sphere. Uh, they can have a drop of colloid in the center, uh, but notably, they always have these very sharply well-defined smooth outer contours. And these really correlate well with what we see on the surgical pathology side of things, these spherules that are oftentimes seen in the center of benign um, adenomatous nodules or hyperplastic nodules, now uh, under the umbrella term of benign follicular nodular disease, uh, that has degenerative changes. Uh, and that's in contrast to the micro follicles where you do have, again, small clusters of thyroid follicle cells that are crowded, have overlapping, don't have that nice, round, smooth border, uh, but do have, um, uh, again, irregularity and an architectural distortion. So uh, what they have found in their, uh, in their studies is that for AUS, uh, for, for basically thyroid nodules that were diagnosed as AUS and had in their micro follicles, uh, seen uh, at least 50% of them composed of thyroid spherules, on surgical resection, every single one of them were benign. So what does that mean for us? So if we see a majority of small follicles seen in uh, this architectural pattern of thyroid spherules, it's likely a benign finding uh, and, and should not uh, warrant necessarily an AUS or follicular neoplasm uh, diagnosis. Now, of course, if you see just a single thyroid spherule, that does not automatically make it benign. And we need a little bit more um, uh, 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 studies and, and uh, confirmation from other practices whether this majority of thyroid spherules truly can be considered a benign finding. But that's really one of the, the, the new changes, new uh, concepts introduced in this third edition of the Bethesda system. Now, if we move on to the uh, atypia of undetermined significance, the so Bethesda 3 category, um, the first and foremost change is, again, we're discouraging the use, uh, the alternative use of the term FLUS, follicular lesion of undetermined significance. And this is really um, uh, because, again, to avoid confusion, the intent uh, at the beginning uh, with the introduction of the Bethesda system was that a laboratory would choose one or the other um, to, de to designate those uh, FNAs as a Bethesda 3 category. Although we've seen in the literature um, and some institutions using a tippy of undetermined significance for those aspirates that have cytologic or nuclear atypia, in other words, uh, concern uh, for papillary thyroid carcinoma, in contrast to using FLUS for those aspirates that had architectural atypia or other uh, forms of atypia. Um, there has also been in the literature or in, in clinical scenarios some confusion between FLUS follicular lesion of undetermined significance and the follicular neoplasm category. And so again, for clarity of communication, uh, we really uh, encourage uh, uh, laboratories and cytopathologists to use just atypia of undetermined significance for that Bethesda 3 category. That being said, um, for the first time, we're also recommending a more formal uh, categorization, subcategorization within the AUS category of AUS with nuclear atypia versus AUS other. And, you know, we'll, we'll go over the rationale for that in these following slides. So since the uh, introduction of the first edition of the Bethesda system for reporting thyroid cytopathology that came out uh, in 2010, numbers, uh, a large number of papers from a number of laboratories have repeatedly shown that there is utility in subcategorizing the AUS category uh, based on the presence or absence of nuclear atypia. And most of these studies again and again have shown that for those aspirates that do have a degree of nuclear or cytologic atypia, the risk of malignancy is much higher than that expected for 
those aspirates that have architectural uh, atypia alone. This is seen not only in the risk of malignancy uh, when with those AUS nodules that go to surgery, uh, but in addition, growing molecular evidence has, has, is also coming to the fore, showing that, you know, in this study that uh, came from, from our institution, uh, senior authored by Machia Nishino, uh, a, a great cytopathologist uh, and colleague uh, of mine here at BIDMC, he show, in this paper, we've shown that um, uh, looking at molecular testing of AUS nodules, those that ha were typified by architectural atypia had a much, much higher proportion of low risk or, or benign molecular testing results compared to those that had cytologic atypia or cytologic atypia combined with architectural atypia. Those, again, that did go to surgery uh, had a much higher proportion of NIFT-P and frank malignancy. So again, AUS with nuclear atypia does have a molecular and a surgical pathology difference compared to other types of atypia um, categorized in the AUS category. So uh, what is this more formal subcategorization? So AUS with nuclear atypia, and that would include in, uh, aspirates that have focal nuclear atypia, um, extensive but very mild nuclear changes, um, atypical cyst lining cells, uh, or the histiocytoid type cells with those nuclear features of papillary uh, that can, can, uh, can pose a diagnostic challenge sometimes. Um, and then also those aspirates that have both nuclear and architectural atypia. And that would be different from AUS other, which uh, would, would correspond to aspirates that are cellular or hypocellular, but are predominated by architectural atypia in the form of microfollicles, um, oncocytic or oncocytic atypia, um, atypia NOS, um, which could be due to uh, 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 unsure, but could be radiation changes or chemotherapy changes or other form forms of odd atypia, um, or nuclear changes not suggestive of papillary thyroid carcinoma. So really this, this, this uh, bifurcation of, of subcategorization in the AUS category um, does historically um, predict a higher risk of malignancy for those with nuclear atypia. And prospectively going forward, it will be interesting to see if, if this leads to differential management for um, nodules classified as AUS, the Bethesda 3 category, um, based on the subcategorization. Next, moving on very briefly to the follicular neoplasm. So uh, the follicular neoplasm uh, category really is typified by cellular aspirates that have a predominance of the follicular cells seen in crowded, tight microfollicles, oftentimes with very little amounts of of uh, little amounts of colloid in the background. These aspirates and these follicular cells can have varying mild amounts of cytologic uh, changes uh, that might be suggestive of papillary thyroid carcinoma or NIFT-P. Um, we do know that NIFT-P uh, tends to concentrate and to be found in aspirates that are either AUS or follicular neoplasm. And with the, the name change of suspicious for a follicular neoplasm to just flat out follicular neoplasm for this category, there are a couple of, of notes that, that might be helpful for uh, clinicians understanding exactly what the implications are for this diagnostic category. The first one is a NIFT-P note that we include in the atlas. And you know this really acknowledges that although the, the architectural features are suggestive of a follicular neoplasm, the presence of some nuclear features raise the possibility of a follicular uh, variant of papillary carcinoma or NIFT-P. And really, the only way to tell those two apart is on surgical resection and not on um, cytologic examination. So again, acknowledging that this could be a NIFT-P, and as such, maybe a more conservative uh, lobectomy or hemithyroidectomy might be appropriate as opposed to going straight to a total thyroidectomy. In addition, um, the, the follicular neoplasm note uh, is something, again, uh, that uh, might be helpful to acknowledge that although we're diagnosing this as follicular neoplasm, parentheses, Bethesda 4, um, up to 30% of aspirates diagnosed as such on FNA 
on follow-up resection turn out to be benign follicular nodular disease. And so it's not, this has always been the case. And uh, some of the reasons why people were more comfortable saying suspicious for a follicular neoplasm. Um, but again, uh, the risk of malignancy uh, of a Bethesda 4 follicular neoplasm um, is on the lowish side and a large proportion of them do turn out to be benign. So a note can certainly be helpful and is a useful um, adjunct uh, to the just strict categorization in some circumstances. Um, uh, the, now the uh, oncocytic uh, follicular neoplasm uh, has its own chapter. Again, beautiful pictures uh, illustrating, you know, what we should include in uh, this uh, diagnostic entity. Uh, once again, we're discouraged now from using the word Herthel cell. We should be using oncocyte or oncocytic uh, follicular neoplasm. And again, this is an aspirate that's usually a hypercellular aspirate composed of exclusively um, cells with oncocytic change. And architecturally, these are seen in, in a pattern other than the flat, evenly spaced sheets that we see in um, uh, oncocytic change seen in the setting of Hashimoto's or uh, chronic lymphocytic thyroiditis um, or uh, just oncocytic uh, change in benign thyroid nodules. Usually colloid is scant, uh, is scant to absence. And we usually do not see the background lymphocytes. Again, something that's very common in a chronic lymphocytic thyroiditis. Um, and the oncocytes can have large cell and small cell dysplasia with uh, nuclear and cellular size variation. So when encountering an, uh, an aspirate like this, we should always think about, so what could be on the differential? What might we be missing? Could this be a medullary thyroid carcinoma, which can have the similar oncocytic single cell pattern uh, in some instances? Or if we see really uh, dramatic nuclear changes above and beyond, which we typically see with oncocytes, could we be dealing with an oncocytic subtype of papillary thyroid carcinoma? Now, uh, there's not enough time to go into all of the other chapters, uh, but just uh, list them here with, with all of the authors that contributed to these great chapters. All of them have been updated based on the literature since 2000, 2017, 2018 from the second edition and have uh, new and replaced images to kind of refresh um, some of those diagnostic criteria that we uh, are so used to seeing. Now, uh, in, in wrapping up uh, uh, the, this talk, I'd like to briefly introduce two new chapters uh, that for the first time are included in this new third edition of the Bethesda System for Reporting Thyroid Cytopathology. And the first one is one uh, on uh, clinical uh, and imaging uh, findings in thyroid nodules. And this is a very brief chapter, but one that really acknowledges that thyroid nodule management really is a multimodal approach that starts with the clinical examination and the clinical findings. Uh, then goes on to the biologic or the serologic findings. Do we have a, a, a high or a low TSH? Is this an active or a, 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 a non-biologically active nodule? Next, imaging plays a big role of, of risk stratification in deciding what actually is FNA for us in cytopathology to examine and, uh, and categorize that aspirate. All of this information goes into the clinical decision-making of whether or not that patient should go to surgery or not and what potentially is the extent of surgery? Is it a total thyroidectomy versus a hemithyroidectomy or a lobectomy? And uh, something that uh, from uh, from my pulmonary pathology side of things, I've very I've always been very attuned to the radiographic findings of a lung nodule or a lung lesion that is being biopsied or sampled by a cytology. Um, Admittedly, over, over, the, uh, over the last decade or so, I've, I haven't had as close uh, an attention paid to the um, ultrasonographic findings of a thyroid nodule, but this is changing, and I think that it's important for all of us as cytologists to, to recognize the importance of the thyroid imaging that leads to us getting uh, a, a thyroid FNA. And really, uh, we can look at uh, the varying uh, qualities of these nodules uh, that really speak to the sense that not all thyroid nodules are created equal. We can have spongiform change, we can have um, solid changes, and we can have, you know, hyperechoic foci. And so there are different um, uh, risk stratification schemes out there, um, uh, TIRAD schemes, that assign uh, the ACR TIRADs, really assign a point value based on different radiographic features that are then uh, summed up to give a, uh, a TIRAD score. 
that tie red score when taken in conjunction with the size of the nodule uh, really um, uh, dictates whether or not an FNA is warranted in that situation or not. It's very similar to the European TIRADS uh, system that is mainly pattern based that um, also when in conjunction with the size of the nodule um, uh, helps decide whether an FNA is needed or not. For the ACR TIRADS scoring, again, we the, the radiographic uh, features based on composition, echogenicity, shape, the margins, and the presence or absence of echogenistic foci, all uh, are assigned different point values. And those point values are then uh, summed up to give a TIRAD score um, based on the ultrasonographic features of that nodule. And it's really important to understand that that TIRAD score does itself also have an implied risk of malignancy. Uh, and so going in, the pretest probability that that nodule is benign or malignant has already um, somewhat been um, uh, worked out from a radiographic standpoint. And so I think that going forward, us in cytopathology might need to pay a little bit more attention to those radiographic findings um, uh, if they are available uh, in, in your practice setting. And lastly, uh, I'd like to conclude the, the final chapter uh, in, in the, the new book is, is, is one that uh, spends uh, uh, some time looking at the advances in the utility of molecular testing in thyroid fine needle aspirations. And of, of course, a whole book or a whole lecture could be, um, could be uh, put together just based on the molecular changes in uh, thyroid uh, thyroid pathology. But in this chapter, uh, we really uh, identified those key molecular changes uh, that typify uh, different thyroid neoplasms and different thyroid lesions. Uh, we talk about the purpose of molecular testing and then also uh, briefly describe different testing platforms. But importantly, uh, not recommending a single testing platform or, or promoting one over another. But from an agnostic way, really saying what different platforms are out there and what's their utility. And uh, as, as many of us are, are familiar with, the, the use of molecular testing uh, has evolved over time. Uh, and so not only has molecular testing been used to help triage those cytologically indeterminate uh, nodules, the AUS or the follicular neoplasm, to identify the molecular uh, and the, the genomic uh, profile of that tumor that would help predict if it should go for surgical referral or rather observation and clinical surveillance. But increasingly so, uh, we've, we've identified uh, molecular alterations that have therapeutic impl implications. So BRAF V600E, NTRAC fusions, RET fusions, that especially for more advanced disease and metastatic disease can help uh, the clinician decide on therapeutic options for that patient. So really, uh, a nice, concise uh, chapter, again, uh, uh, led by Machia Nishino, uh, my colleague here at BIDMC, a beautiful chapter that I hope you all check out. Uh, and so with that, um, uh, to, to conclude, uh, hopefully uh, you've gotten appreciation over this last hour or so of the third edition of the Thesa system for reporting thyroid cytopathology that really in my mind is an evolution and a maturation of the most widely used thyroid FNA reporting system used uh, today. Um, and in this new edition, third edition, we've uh, simplified things and have uh, agreed upon a single name for each category. We've refined the risks of malignancy, not only for adult, but also for pediatric thyroid nodule FNAs. We have harmonized the terminology to be in line with that used in the fifth edition of the WHO um, uh, classification of thyroid neoplasms. Um, uh, nice from a visual standpoint, about 40% of the, uh, the photomicrographs and the pictures in the new third edition are new and replaced. And so if you have the first and the second editions on your bookshelf, if for no other reason, the new third edition atlas will be a nice uh, way to see other examples of all of these diagnostic cytomorphologic features uh, to help you uh, in, in category, best categorizing thyroid FNAs. Of course, the literature has been updated and refreshed, and we have now, for the first time, new chapters on clinical and imaging and molecular testing. And in and, and, and concluding, you know, this really represents the work of over two years of, of no, a number of individuals from across the globe. And so thank you, thank you. Uh, to everyone in the cytology and the thyroid community for contributing to uh, what hopefully should be a very useful uh, tool in thyroid cytopathology going forward.
And with that, uh, thank you so very much for your time. Um, I look forward to answering any questions uh, that uh, I think Leslie has been monitoring in the chat. And so uh, thanks. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Uh, Vanderland, for that um, exceptional overview. This is incredibly timely because I believe the um, uh, the edition, this latest edition, has been released at the beginning of this month. Is that correct? It, it is. It's 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 now in it print, now and so <laughs> at newsstands near you. <laughs> Wonderful. And then also thank you again for um, highlighting, um, you know, just giving us a brief overview of how our uh, the cytopathology community has really collectively come together in this unified effort to harmonize uh, terminology across all the different systems. And then you pointed out in terms of the latest WHO classifications, I believe you pointed out lung and pancreatic biliary are now available online, correct? And I'm not sure if it's still in beta testing mode or not. Um, could Do you have uh, any updates on that? Because I know yes. it's available. Yeah, yeah. So, so uh, the the uh, lung and pancreatic biliary are, are in print. I can I can't reach, but it's on my bookshelf. So those are in print and online. Um, mm -hmm. And so those are in full, uh, you know, fully, uh, you know, first edition published. All of the other ones are under work. They haven't been um, released online or anything yet, but those should be coming out in the months and years ahead. Yes, absolutely. And so that I'm kind of pointing out a little bit here for, for, for those groups that are able to have access to the online versions, they're incredibly convenient and I believe relatively inexpensive. So hopefully um, folks can um, check that out online. So let's um, quickly look at the, um, we have some questions from our participants. There's a couple from one, um, uh, from the same participant. And so I'll just kind of, I'm not sure if you can see this Dr. Vandal Land, but basically um, one question is, what is the recommendation do, of new, doing fine needle aspiration cytology in, in the thyroid? Is it supposed to be image guided? And then as a, a, another question from the same individual um, to sort of uh, clarify the difference between identifying macro versus micro follicles cytologically and significance in diagnosis. So maybe uh, concisely, you know, pulling those, those things together in terms of um, giving us a quick review about the standard approach um, for thyroid FNA. Yeah, sure, sure. Um, uh, so to answer the first question first um, about um, uh, how FNA should be performed, um, uh, really um, larger thyroid nodules certainly can be palpated and palpation um, you, you know, uh, is, is certainly a, a fine way to perform FNAs. Um, ultrasound guidance um, uh, is, is better able at, at targeting and, and identifying smaller nodules and, and ensuring that you're in the nodule. Um, but if you do not in your practice setting have the availability of ultrasound guidance, either by a cytopathologist or by uh, endocrinologist, um, certainly, you know, good old fashioned palpation for larger thyroid nodules is, is, is more than adequate and can be augmented by on-site evaluation. If you have a cytopathologist on site, you know, performing adequacies that can, you know, help uh, bring the, the diagnostic and the accuracy rate um, up. Uh, again, uh, the ultrasound guidance um, is really the standard across many medical centers here in the United States. And um, at most institutions, uh, almost all thyroid FNAs um, uh, are done under ultrasound guidance. Again, being able to target smaller nodules um, and uh, also, you know, being able to incorporate the TIRADS, uh, you know, uh, imaging uh, assessment in as well. So... Uh, so that's the first question. And then the second oh, one about... I, um, sorry, can I just oh, interject just absolutely. very quickly in terms of um, the... Um, sorry, my camera keeps going in and out here. But um, in terms of... Uh, I'm just trying to th place myself in the shoes of, you know, if we have a see and treat situation where in, in an individual comes in with a neck mass that is maybe rapidly enlarging, that seems to be in the thyroid that may present for an emergent FNA, for example, that's palpation guided. Sort of what would be your thought process rapidly growing nodule um, for the cytopathologist to expect. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and again, if, you know, in not having any imaging findings, right, um, uh, you know, because a rapidly, uh, from the benign side of things, you can think about a cystic lesion. So is this a cyst? Is this, you know, is that causing the rapid enlargement? However, uh, you know, if it really is from palpation, if you don't have any imaging to go on as well, rapidly enlarging, if you feel a very firm uh, nodule, um, that's that that is is fixed to the structure of the neck. You know, then 
know, that's a, a red flag and a warning that you might be dealing with an anaplastic thyroid carcinoma, one of the very aggressive, uh, locally aggressive uh, thyroid uh, uh, cancers that oftentimes arises in the background of a more well-differentiated uh, thyroid carcinoma. Uh, but that certainly can be a red flag. And then uh, other other things to think about if it's rapid if, if you have a rapidly enlarging thyroid gland as a whole is it painful or not um, was there an upper respiratory tract infection you know so you can think about inflammatory conditions as well but certainly you know Leslie you really comment on yeah the clinical presentation really does um, hone down on your differential and what you might think about going into uh, a, a thyroid or neck mass FNA. Perfect. Sorry to interrupt, but just wanted to see if we can get some pearls from the expert um, in, a, in, in more um, practical situations. And so then, uh, sorry, the follow-up question, um, if you can briefly talk about difference between macrofollicles and microfollicles uh, and their cytologic uh, significance. Yeah, yeah. So macrofollicles, um, if we think about macrofollicles, that is, uh, you know, a, a large uh, on cytology, on smears or on liquid based preparations. When you have a large intact follicle with a central core of colloid, that is usually disrupted in, and opens up and breaks apart and leaves leads to a very uh, a flat sheet of, of evenly spaced follicular cells. And so when you see larger uh, fragments of, of follicular cells, again, with the nuclei evenly spaced apart, um, that you're likely dealing with a macro follicle. Now, you could have a large macro follicle that's broken up into little small pieces. And so if you have um, a collection of 10 or 12 or 8 follicular cells, but they're all in the same plane and they're evenly spaced, that's likely a, a macro follicular fragment, right? So a, a piece of that large sheet that has just been sheared off or, or came off. Now that's in contrast again to what should potentially raise a red flag is when we see micro follicles. So micro follicles, there's no absolute limit of, of how many nuclei there have to be or what's the upper limit of, of a micro follicle. But in general, you know, micro follicles tend to have maybe five to 12 uh, or 15 uh, follicular cells that are clustered in a tight three-dimensional cluster um, that are not evenly spaced. They're, uh, they're crowded against each other um, and uh, generally do not have a, a droplet of colloid in the center. And so that three-dimensional um, uh, tight, small cluster of follicular cells um, again, indicates that we might be dealing with a neoplastic process, a follicular neoplasm uh, or a NIFT-P or a follicular variant of PTC, if there are some nuclear changes there as well. So really it's, it's the, so macro follicle versus micro follicle. The two things that really stick out in my mind are number one, um, is, it, is it a flat sheet or is it three dimensional? So by focusing up and down, if you see three dimensionality to a cluster of cells that are tightly packed, you're probably dealing with a micro follicle versus if you just have four or five fo follicular cells but are pretty much all in the same plane and evenly spaced apart, that's probably just a piece of a macro follicular fragment. So number one, is there a, a three dimensionality? And then number two, the size, right? And so um, you, you oftentimes can have large macro follicular fragments that um, uh, on an aspirate uh, or on a smear can be kind of clustered uh, or folded up on itself. Uh, but again, as long as you see long stretches of contiguous, um, evenly spaced uh, follicular cells, that really is a nice benign finding. Oops, uh, yeah. I think you're muted. Um, I'll squeeze in one last question from the audience. Um, because it, it uh, points out on a new um, coverage in the in this edition, um, we have a question about um, molecular characteristics for various thyroid nodules. Are they similar in both pediatric and adult patients, and how do you utilize such information in resource limited settings? Yeah, yeah, that's really interesting. And so um, uh, uh, there is a, so. A, a couple of points there. I, I talked about how, you know, for the first time, we're able to provide risk of malignancies in th pediatric thyroid nodules. And so the number of just the absolute number of thyroid FNAs in pediatric patients is smaller. And then even smaller still are those pediatric thyroid nodules that have molecular testing. And so it is a little bit of, uh, of, of an unknown. And so we don't have that really 
well-trod track record um, that we do have for um, uh, for adult uh, thyroid nodules. Now, that being said, there are some re some really great studies out there, and, and one of them that came um, uh, from uh, Vanderbilt uh, with uh, Vivian Weiss, uh, really uh, amazing, comprehensive uh, look at the genomic landscape of pediatric thyroid nodule FNAs. Um, I think that was published in JAMA Oncology um, uh, a year or so ago. So I, I would direct um, the audience to that paper. Again, a really nice um, uh, uh, paper looking at the landscape of, of molecular alterations in pediatric thyroid nodules. Um, is it the same? It's not exactly the same as, you know, proportion-wise that we see in adults. Yes, you know, for you know, papillary thyroid carcinomas of um, in, in pediatric patients, we do still see BRAF E600E mutations, but there are other translocations and gene fusions that are a little bit more common in pediatric patients um, uh, than seen in in other uh, adult uh, adult thyroid nodules. So, um, yeah, yeah. Again, really fascinating question. I think that we are gaining more and more uh, information as we go forward. But check out that JAMA Oncology paper um, from Vivian Weiss's group at, at Vanderbilt. Um, really a fantastic paper. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, I, we are a little bit over time, but hopefully we were able to capture these additional fascinating questions and commentary. So again, thank you, Dr. Vanderland, for that uh, incredible overview, a very timely topic. Um, and so I will um, like to close by again thanking Dr. Vanderland for coming to speak on this timely topic to all of our participants. And a reminder that um, for the histopathology session, there will be one August 23rd. And for cytopathology, we have an echo session coming on August 30th. So please stay tuned and we will see you then. Thank you again, everyone, and take care and have a wonderful rest of the day. Bye-bye.